Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Chrissy O'Malley and this is Better Science Teaching. I just feel like I have a lot to say about high school teaching today. Um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about, specifically about what it takes to become a teacher after you finish a PhD um, and maybe a little bit of the variability and give you a heads up about it. My specific path is that my background is in biology, chemistry, and geology. I have degrees in all three fields. Uh, and then I became a high school teacher in the state of Ohio, and my license is an integrated science license, which means that I am qualified to teach um, any high school science subject, and I have. I've taught um, physics, biology, AP biology, chemistry, honors chemistry, and earth science. I've taught all of those. So if you want to... If you wanna go from holding a PhD and no teaching credential to being a high school teacher, I have a couple recommendations for you. Um, a lot of folks think that this is a really easy jump and I would encourage you to put some time and effort into developing yourself as a teacher. I think it will make you a better job candidate. What a lot of people think is, oh, well, if I have a PhD, then I'm eligible to teach at a university, which means that high schools would be happy to have me, right? Like I'm a teacher, no. No. And the reason is because if you're working with minor children instead of young adults, it's it's a different ballgame because the rules are very different in those types of settings. Um, you know, as when I taught, when I was a teaching assistant and a lecturer and an adjunct professor, you know, I would just be happy that my students would show up all the time. In high school, they have to show up. So now they're there, which means they can't just leave if they don't want to be there. So you have to deal with um, classroom management is very different. You have to interact with parents and there's a lot of legal things that you have to be aware of. So I would strongly encourage you to take a full set of teaching and pedagogy courses from a university, have, have the university apply for your teaching license for you, um, as opposed to submitting your transcript to the Ohio Department of Education. If you submit to the Ohio Department of Education or any other Department of Education, your coursework isn't going to get you all the way there. It's just not. So the things that I had to do to be able to get my teaching license, and I accomplished my license in one year uh, with student teaching and 30 credit hours of coursework. So I, uh, I had to take a full, grab my notebook. So I keep a portfolio with all my stuff in it. To get a teaching license, most universities will require that uh, you need to take a certain, a certain series of classes. If you have a PhD, if you have a bachelor's degree, so minimum would be if you have a bachelor's degree in the subject you want to teach in a lot of places that I've looked, uh, then you're going to need a set of pedagogy courses. For me, I had to take uh, a philosophical study of education, a course called the profession of teaching, something called the profession of teaching lab, which was really me observing a teacher in a class, uh, theories of learning and human development, Instruction, assessment, and management, um, a lab for that, which was more ob observation. My school would set that up for me. Um, educational diversity in student populations, class and lab. Uh, critical reading in the content areas. That one was one that surprised me because I thought I can critically think in my content area. That's not what this class is about. This class is about how to teach students to critically think in your content area. And if you've always been good at school, this comes easy to you. Your average student, it is not easy to take the class. It was kind of fun anyway, because it was with a bunch of people who are in middle school and elementary school. And you will find that these kinds of teachers self-sort and they are different. And I really enjoyed hanging out with them because... I think that they were funner than me. Okay, um, and then I had to take another course about science teaching methods. That class, that class was great. It was with um, a teacher named Diana Hun, who was amazing. And I, I always felt like, like from the first day that she was running out of time to teach this class, like there was not enough hours in the day for her to tell us all the things that she wanted to tell us. And I, I think that that was accurate. Um, yes, she was amazing. Uh, we had to take a class called Models of Teaching and then Introduction to Education Research. And the reason that that class was important, actually, Models of Teaching and Introduction to Education Research were two courses that I took much later um, because the courses that I took to get my licensure were less than a master's degree. 
All I needed were two more classes and they were about doing education research and I was very interested in them. And um, I went back and took them to finish my licensure as a degree because why not? Uh, so take the classes, do the student teaching, it will help you. In fact, do the student teaching in the geographic area where you plan to teach because that will help you to build a local network. Teachers know each other. I've I, just encountering them with the Ohio Academy of Science, with different science fairs, with Science Olympiad, um, with being involved in different courses across the state. So I'm in, I'm in several communities where we've taken courses together at different universities. I've taken courses since I've gotten licensed at Ohio State, and I've taken courses since I've gotten licensed at Wright State, and I know teachers in different age levels. So if you if you are um, doing things locally, that really helps your network. And your network is helpful because if you're looking for opportunities in other places, then people know you, you know, is you're already known to them. So so that's that's a good thing to consider. In addition to taking the courses that I have on my transcript that I just pulled out, I had to also take a series of tests. Before I began my student teaching, I had to pass subject level tests in all four sciences. Um, luckily for me, they actually have comboed tests that they take. And so I took one test that was physics and chemistry and one test that was biology and geology. Um, if you were doing individual sciences, you can do any of those four individually. Your job opportunities will be better if you do more fields. Um, you know, so if you're a physics person, see if you qualify for math, see if you've taken enough math classes to qualify. Um, and those are going to be largely course-based and not test-based. So it's not that you can just go take the test and get licensed for it. You have to have the coursework to back it up. Uh, in addition to those content tests, I had to take um, a test called the Principles of Learning and Teaching, the PLT. I also had to complete something called the EdTPA. If you were getting a license now, you have to do it. Um, if if you were doing it the year that I was doing it, it was still sort of in testing. And so we had to complete it because they were collecting data on the test, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't going to influence whether or not I got a teaching license. I have also had to do, I'm checking my list to make sure I don't miss these. Yeah, I had to do student teaching, which involved several observations um, that were part of my licensure programming. Uh, then I got my license in Ohio. You get a um, you get sort of a provisional license in the first five years after you get your license in the state of Ohio. I think it's five years. You have to do four years of something called the RESA, the Resident Educator um, Summative Assessment. And so what that is, the first two years is like how to be a teacher, mentor stuff. The third year you do the actual assessment, which depending on the year is. Um, several rounds of essays that you write as a teacher along with student sample work. So the year that I did it, I had to do four essays and then they took it down to three essays and I'm not sure where they're at now. Might be two. Um, I think it's three. It might be two though. Uh, so I had to complete that, which to me felt kind of funny after I have two degrees in education now and, and a PhD and here I am doing the RESA. Anyway, after you get the RESA, then, then you have a a permanent license, which which means you have to keep taking classwork. Teaching is kind of weird that way. Like you have to keep you have to keep doing uh, CEUs, continuing education credits, and those make you eligible to reapply for your next permanent license. Yeah. So um, what I decided to do is I have this thing where I I think intentional professional development is kind of important, and the thing that I wanted to do next was. Um, get a credential for gifted education because I do work with AP students and I do work with honor students. And a couple years ago, the state of Ohio seemed to be going sort of this route where, you know, if you worked with really advanced students, you were going to need additional credit or additional training or a credential for working with gifted students. And so I thought, you know, I'll just, I'll just go ahead and do that. So I did 30 hours in gifted education. And now I have what, what is officially an endorsement is a gifted intervention specialist, which is cool. I don't have any extra responsibilities with it. I don't get paid extra for having done it. Um, I did it because I wanted to do it. And I wanted to understand my students better. So, yeah. I've been looking at administrative licenses. I'm not sure what I'm going to do next. I had considered, <laughs> I had considered doing a physics degree. 
because I don't have one. I don't know. My husband says I need to be cut off from school. Anyway, um, <laughs> I, I will also throw in here that after, after all of that training, um, the first year that I was that I was sort of on the market as a professional classroom teacher, I put out 34 applications, I got 14 interviews, and I was not offered a job until the 13th interview. And that job offer came, I think it was 10 days before school started. And so I had 10 days to come up with childcare for two children, um, to work on my wardrobe a little bit because I had been a graduate student and then a stay at home mom. And I did, I did not have business casual outfits to last a week. Uh, I also had to attend a couple of days of training for the district. It was a busy, it was a busy 10 days. Um, but you know, we got that, we got that going pretty well. So yeah, I am curious if you all have questions about what it's like to teach high school after completing a PhD. Um, there are things that I love about it. There's not really a lot that I hate about it. I'm not a morning person, but whatever. Some of my students aren't either. Um, <laughs> it's nice if I have a couple of morning people in my first period class, because then they'll talk to me. I mean, I can say uh, some of the things that I do, I, I teach courses. I also work with science fair and our, our research program at our school, which is pretty strong. I coach Science Olympiad. I have coached our iGEM team in the past. It's no longer, it's no longer running. Um, I also coach FIRST Robotics. Anyway, I would encourage you, if you are looking at high school teaching as a, as a alternate to being a professor or working at a university, that you try not to have the attitude of like, that this is my fallback plan. This isn't really what I want to do, but I'll do it because I need pay stuff. No, because the people that that you will be working with and the people that you will be competing with for those jobs are people who have thrown themselves into it uh, wholeheartedly. And so I, I have found people who are high school teachers to be some of the most impassioned teachers that there are. I, uh, I wish you luck this year. I'm, I'm hoping to put together some things about teaching after having a PhD. So if you have any questions, please feel free to throw them in the comments. I'd be happy um, to try to help people out and understand what this career path is like and what you need to do to be successful at it. I hope you all have a great day. I'll see you soon.